local stories, local people. We're taking you inside Western Mass News. It's the Even Better Western Mass Podcast with Dave Madsen. Welcome to this week's edition of the Even Better Western Mass Podcast. Wherever you are, I do hope you're doing well. Hard to believe it's been a year since the first death in this country from COVID-19. That number is approaching 500,000 in the United States, nearly 3 million around the world, and about 15,000 people have died here in Massachusetts. And as we uh, roll through the vaccine rollout, of course, frustration growing from people trying to get that COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, The Boston Globe reporting that Massachusetts officials have had to halt shipments to sites with doses sitting in freezer shelves while fielding a stream of complaints from people who are unable to book vaccine appointments. Uh, Growing frustration. Uh, They're scrambling to open a call in line and streamline an online registration portal. And this is uh, one of the most troubling facts I've I've read. According to the CDC, Massachusetts now ranks 34th nationally in per capita vaccinations. So we've got a way to go. I know the governor is trying to speed things up and uh, let's hope that can happen. So wear those masks and continue to social distance. We're a long way from being out of the woods. Well, now to this week's podcast. My guest is Springfield Congressman Richard Neal. First elected to Congress in 1988, he now serves as chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. We had a lot to talk about, as you might imagine, including the COVID-19 relief package working its way through Congress, the January 6th attack on the Capitol, where he was when that happened, and his experience that day, the divide between Democrats and Republicans, and the Joe Biden who he knows from 33 years on Capitol Hill. Here's my conversation with Congressman Richard Neal. First of all, Congressman Neal, thank you for uh, taking time to do the uh, Even Better Western Mass podcast with me today. I do appreciate it. Glad to be with you, Dave. Uh, As this airs, uh, Donald Trump's second impeachment trial is getting underway. Uh, Let's start with your thoughts on that. Well, I think that I'm sitting in a room that was under assault on January 6th, including Capitol Police that had their guns drawn in this very room with the table that is in front of me hoisted against the doors of the Ways and Means room here. And the windows were broken. Capitol was under assault. Just about an hour ago, as I glanced out the window and after having attended a a funeral acknowledgement for that police officer that was killed this morning, I stared out the windows, contrasted what it was like on January 6th with the funeral procession that was being assembled. And it's a reminder of just what went on here. And the argument that is being made in the one article of impeachment is that the president incited the mob to assault the capital, the citadel of democracy that the world acknowledges. And I think that uh, as much as we all wish it were different, it happened. And the president fed those rumors, that misinformation for 77 days about the fact that he said meant that he won the election. There was no evidence to acknowledge that. He lost the election by 7 million votes and Joe Biden picked up 306 electoral votes, the same number I believe that Donald Trump picked up four years ago. So the impeachment proceeding here, I think calls attention to the purposeful misleading of the American people that ended in an insurrection by a mob here on January 6th. Do you think there are 17 votes in the Senate to uh, get him impeached or in in the long run with this, do you see some kind of uh, censure or a reprimand for him? Well, I think it's unlikely that he's gonna be convicted given the preceding votes that have taken place. It'll be interesting to see where some of the Republican leadership comes down, but uh, not to miss the essential point. And that is that the argument has to be made, attention should be called to what happened here on January 6th, and that uh, the former president had a hand in inciting the mob. Is this more about making sure that Donald Trump is not able to run for office ever again? No, I think it's more about calling attention to his actions and his words, as he again incited this mass movement. Those that were rampaging through the Capitol Again, right outside the doors of this space in which I'm sitting, for 40 minutes, they pounded on the doors, pushed and shoved. 
And to be sitting in this office with a Capitol patrolman with his gun drawn and three other Capitol policemen here is, I think, indicative of what took place on January 6th. I think it was President Trump's overtures to the incitement that brought them up Capitol Hill from the ellipse. Let's talk about that day, January 6th. I've, I've spoken with uh, with Bill Trangizi about it and, and, and what he experienced that day. Uh, exactly where were you when you first got word that the Capitol was under attack? I was literally here. It was about between 1.30 and 1.45 on January 6th. I was on a Zoom call with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis. We were conversing about the outcome, the final determination of Brexit. We had previously discussed my insistence that there be no return of a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. About 20 minutes into the conversation, Brandon Lewis and I were exchanging pleasantries because I was very happy about the outcome that made sure the border was not restored. I then said, we're noticing a little bit more tumultuous behavior here. And two staffers behind the screen started to signal to me that I needed to cut off the interview. Earlier that day, I had looked out the windows of this office and I didn't see much of a crowd. Well, I can tell you by two o'clock, there was a crowd and you could see them going through the doors of the Capitol. They came up through the east entrance on the House of Representatives side of the Capitol. They broke the windows of the office that I'm in. And they were chanting outside every epithet that you could think, pounding on the doors. The doors were bowing as they uh, pushed and shoved. And after about 40 minutes of mayhem, they moved on. The police escorted us through this very cavernous stairway over to room 1100, which is also a ways and means room in the Longworth building. So was I fearful for my life? I had the confidence in the Capitol Police, but were there a few difficult moments? There sure were. And perhaps the most telling was when the Deputy Sergeant at Arms said, I would like you all to write down your names and your addresses as to where you're from on this piece of paper in case this goes awry. She carefully took it, folded it, and put it in her pocket. We're going to try to secure a copy of it, incidentally. It, it, it's frightening and just watching it unfold that day and and the more we learn about what happened that day um now your 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 other office uh, I, uh, one of the pictures that stunned me was the picture uh, was sent out of of a, a long conference table that was shoved that's up the against one. the door yeah that's the one that we pushed against the door six of us picked it up and moved it against the door the table's massive i'm sitting in front of it right now do you, do you think that some of these people were, uh, their targets were some congressmen and women, and they were going to take them hostage and, and try to do harm? They made it clear that that was their intent. In fact, I think it, uh, a couple have been arrested who said that they wanted to put a bullet in the head of Nancy Pelosi. There were others that had handcuffs. They were armed. And the seizure of Speaker Pelosi's office by these recalcitrants was a warning from them, and I don't think this is over. I think the internet, for all the common and good purposes that it has created, has also allowed many of these conspiracy-driven folks to meet up faster. Many of them are unhinged, and they buy these conspiracies. And we're gonna debate one tomorrow in the House of Representatives, a woman who is a strict advocate and adherent of QAnon. You're talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, let's talk about that as far as uh, members of the Senate and the House who on that day who were supporting uh, President Trump's contention that the election was stolen. Uh, should there be action taken against them? Well, the action that should be taken would be through the voters back in their respective congression districts. So I don't think that we're talking about removing them from Congress that is not within the purview of our responsibilities. But I do think that we can sanction them, acknowledging that what they have stated in terms of these conspiracies, that the Clintons took down JFK's junior's plane, that uh, Jews are responsible for the forest fires in California, that 
Barack, oh, I'm sorry, that Barack Obama was not born in America, that he was a citizen of Kenya, and that uh, many of these other conspiracies are just so wild that you would think that who would believe them? But apparently there are members of Congress now who do. Do you see uh, her own party stripping her of her committee assignments, or is that something that's going to fall to the uh, Democratic leadership? Well, I would hope that they would advance the argument. I think that it would be a great irony if they sanctioned Liz Cheney, who voted for impeachment, and they leave uh, the gentlelady from Georgia alone. That would tell you where their priorities are these days. But the Republican Party is more and more, I think, a hostage to what many of these people think and do. And Leader McConnell, to his credit, has in the last 24 hours once again admonished this behavior. And I think that it is a responsibility for all of us who might have agreements or disagreements between our respective parties and the citizenry not to promote, promote violence that ransacked this capital on January 6th. I know President Biden has called for the parties to work together. Is it gone beyond that? Uh, no, I don't think it has. In fact, we were on a call this morning with him, the Democratic caucus. It was a great relief to hear from a president who spoke in confident terms, spoke easily, talked about his priorities, and by the way, said, if Republicans have good ideas in this coming COVID package, I'm open to them. He had 10 of them to the White House. Tell me what's on your minds. That doesn't mean you agree with them, but it means that there is this chance over the course of those two hours and subsequent proceedings that will take place in the House in the next three weeks uh, to have a good conversation about this. If they've got helpful suggestions, I'm certainly open to them as well. You and I have talked about this before as far as the the growing divide between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, that are, in, in your mind, do you see there's, there's two factions or even more factions of the Republican Party? There's the Trump faction, and then there's the more moderate faction with the Mitt Romneys and, and people like that? Well, I mean, I think part of the problem they have is that they didn't stand up to the to Trumpism five years ago. Yeah. They all would roll their eyes in many instances about the success he was having. And if you consider today that 60% of the Republicans in America believe that the election was stolen, he's perpetrated that lie. And, and I think that uh, the divide has grown because I think that you've witnessed more and more members of Congress from both sides. It's more about promoting their brand than it is about legislating. And it's also, I think, uh, the result now of more than two decades of the people who got elected to Congress ran against Congress. And let me say this, Dave, the media cover conflict. Process is gone. I mean, if you want to uh, raise your profile in Congress, promote conflict. That'll get you to the cable shows. It'll get you the quotes. What it doesn't get you is good, sound legislation. It's been interesting to see. I was reading an article this morning about the fact that since Trump is no longer president, uh, Fox News ratings have gone down considerably. Uh, they're struggling to find something to cover. Well, the other part of the challenge they have is their decision to go more to opinion, which I thought was impossible for them to do. I didn't think they could go to any more opinion than they already had. But a reminder that what they've done is by calling the election in Arizona early, they've earned the president's wrath. So you now have these other media outlets that are more extreme that many of his supporters are dialing into. So I think that that's part of the challenge we have as well. I mean, many of these shows here, if, you, if you're flipping the, dial, flipping the dial, they're unhinged. And yet they have these developing audiences. And I, mean, I think that part of our job as the elected is not to entertain the American people. It's to inform them. But let's be candid. You know you were a terrific newsman in your time. You knew what was fact and what was fiction, and you sorted it, and you weren't buying fiction. And today, I mean, I'm struck by the fact that entertainment has made its way more and more into mainstream news coverage, of which you were a mainstream news coverer. <laughs> Do you see yourself doing more things like this, bypassing mainstream media uh, to be able to get the message across directly to your constituents where you can just sit and talk about it? One of the things I like about uh, technology and the podcast now is that, I mean, the last thing I'm going to be doing is dealing with a podcast from QAnon. And the last thing I'm going to be doing is 
dialing into uh, some of these wacky initiatives and programs. But I find these podcasts, it's a chance to speak in complete sentences, to finish your paragraphs, to have an honest engagement back and forth. And I find that even on the weekends, as you recall, I've never lost my interest in the gym. So I find myself on weekends, if I'm running or taking long walks or working out in the gym, I love listening to podcasts now. And it's a nice way to generate some interest while you're uh, tensing up those muscles. So yes, the answer is I do like it, but I'm still baffled by how some of these programs have gotten one person to watch, never mind tens of thousands. It is it is amazing in this day and age. I, I just it it baffles me too. But like I, I look for me, it's hey, it's good for me in retirement, and, and it gives me a chance to sit down and talk with folks like you, which makes it nice. Um, well, I will take the uh, one of the nicest things that happened to me along the way was meeting people like yourself, Ray Herschel, Keith Silver, Durham Caldwell, Jim Madigan, and I look back to the Cy Beckers of the world and others. They did news, you all did news. And again, if you got hoodwinked, you were never going back to that source. That was all there was to it. That was the lifelong punishment. But I also think that it's fair to say that that kind of relationship now is hard to nurture. And if you give a two minute pitch and you get 10 seconds of coverage, you've done something. I, I still, my staff will tell you, I start the day with a full bevy of newspapers, you know, night before I'm you know, going through my feed like everybody else, but it's discerning. Mm -hmm. And I stay within the mainstream, the context that all of you delivered in terms of credibility uh, was essential. I think back to many times where you or Ray and uh, Channel 40, you would have a uh, 11 o'clock deadline. You would think nothing of calling me at quarter of 11 to say, is this true or isn't it? And if I said to you, no, don't buy that, you did the follow up the next day, but you didn't buy it. Yeah. And I, I think, again, that that goes back to there's in general, there's a, a lack of trust. And, you know, you look at it and go, all right, so how much has and we know we know how much uh, social media played into what happened on January 6th. But just in general, in this day and age, that there's so much information out of out there and so much of it is just flat out wrong. Well, not only is it flat out wrong, it has a diabolical twist to it. It is embraced by those who have uh, odd beliefs and behavior to begin with. And uh, the point that I was gonna make earlier as well, when I would be interviewed by all of you folks, for me, it was fine. I mean, one of the nice comments is Jim Madigan was near death. He was asked who his favorite uh, individual interview was, and he said, me. He said, I just, we talked to the guy. He said, we talked about a lot of things. And he said, I always thought that it was up front and candid. And I, I think now that the embrace of these wild theories, and by the way, paranoia is not limited to the right in America. I mean, it's pretty widespread. Mm -hmm. And the problem you have now is that it's more and more becoming baked into the system. One of the things, and this is just as an observer, that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of room anymore for someone to be in the middle. It's either extreme left or it's extreme right. And if you don't agree with me, well, you're wrong. Uh, Joe Biden seems like he's more, a mo he's, he's a moderate, always has been. And, and uh, there's more of a place for that because I think most Americans are moderate. They are now more and more embracing the positions you've just described. It's overwhelming. And I think it's also fair to say, when you look at how Joe Biden became president, it's pretty wild. It was a disaster in Iowa, not much better in New Hampshire. And all of a sudden, by the time he got to South Carolina, after he won that primary, he didn't spend any money or time in Texas or Massachusetts or any other place. And he was winning easily because I think Democrats woke up and said, he's the only one that can get elected president on our side. And I think that in addition to that, that he's an institutionalist, as you know I am, the regular order, amendments, process, hear what everybody's got to say, and then you move. So again, 
you've created this atmosphere today, or not you, but we've created this atmosphere in America today, where if you shape the narrative through being loud, you think you're going to prevail, where it is still, I think many of us would believe in moving through the system of amendment and understanding that it's legislation that changes our lives, not just noise. It is nice to see as far as watching the nightly news that or waking up in the morning and wondering what's been tweeted the night before that there there seems to be a sense of common normalcy there. And, and and I also get the impression that leaders like Mitch McConnell are breathing a huge sigh of relief that they don't have to wake up every morning and worry what happened overnight. Well, you know, one of the things that we're all uh, disciples of is politely called uh, the news cycle. And the news cycle was appended, if you remember, with this stunning surprise, almost within hours of becoming president, Donald Trump began tweeting. Nobody was ready for it. And then it became his moniker, if I might, that that's what he did every day. So he had the ability in the morning to change the news cycle within hours. So whatever we were talking about at 10 o'clock, if he tweeted out something that was outrageous, the media embraced it. And then we were all asked how to react to it. And it kind of got, a, I shouldn't say kind of, it got us off the beaten path of legislating because we were always responding to this outrage or that outrage. And I, I look back at uh, some of those tweets were wild. And I'm glad that media in the mainstream began to call it out. Let's talk about the the first couple of weeks of the Biden presidency. He's done a lot, gotten a lot done. Um, of course, his main priority is 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 COVID nineteen and getting that under control. Uh, assess the first couple of weeks of the Biden pres presidency for me. Well, I think we're always in the executive capacity, mayor, governor, or president. In some measure, you're expected to contrast your positions with the person that you've succeeded. So that's an immediacy, and I think all presidents do it. He has embraced a series of orders, executive orders, and I think that by and large, they've been pretty good. The challenge is, as Lyndon Johnson noted with an executive order, is that the next president can undo it. So Trump undid many of Obama's executive orders. I remember all the way back to George Bush and Bill Clinton and undoing each other's orders as they came along. So when you undo the order, it's not a lasting consequence. So I think he's gotten off to a good start. I think that the optics of how he's performed, I think the calmness with which he's embraced many of these policies, and he's demonstrated he's going to be a good listener. But I do think that uh, healing the American soul, as he frequently spoke of on the campaign trail, is essential. Talk to me, if you could, about the Joe Biden that you know. You've known him for a long, long time. Uh, what we don't know about Joe Biden that, that you would know. Well, there's not much that we don't know about Joe Biden. I can tell you, he's been around for so long that uh, everybody knows just about everything. But I think there's a great human interest story there. I, I think that uh, it's now being reported about personal challenges that he felt along the way. I mean, we all knew in school a friend who might have had a problem stammering. And he overcame that stutter. And he talked about how it challenged his life. He had a great tragedy early on in life, losing his wife and children. And uh, one of the things that I think that is consequential about Joe Biden is its perseverance. He stays with it. You know, the easiest thing for all of us in life is to be discouraged when we get up in the morning. The question is never whether or not you're discouraged, it's what you do about the discouragement. And you pick it up and you move on. And I think that's been one of the great lessons in this life. The other part of his life that also, he would be well regarded and well liked in the United States Senate for those who served with him. They would not feel uh, that uh, acrimony that oftentimes we see now simmering in American politics. I think Mitch McConnell would say Joe Biden's a decent guy. I, and I think that uh, many of the other Republicans in the Senate would say the same thing. I know one of the things that has been said about him is his, his ability to be able to sit down with the opposing side and be able to work something out. Well, we were all masters of polite conversation at one time. Now it's become, you know, you know Katie bar the door. Uh, it's the constant invective that has infected the system. 
And it's that constant quest for more conflict and more conflict and more conflict. I mean, Justice Holmes was correct. Justice Holmes said that conflict was the core of life. But the American people expect cooperation to get things done. So there used to be the opening salvo of conflict, and then you would find uh, where you agreed, and then you would try to hammer out a package in the end that, that you found acceptable. Never necessarily what you loved, but something that you liked. Yeah, something that both sides could live, live with. Right. Somebody got Each side got a little something out of it, right? Well, I mean, you always wanted to make sure that even the losing side could take a bow. I mean, there's nothing more regrettable than triumphalism. Because what triumphalism means, it means the other side's waiting for you at the next turn of the bend. That's what it means. They're coming back. No matter what. Let's talk about the the, uh, the COVID-19 relief package. I know, as you mentioned, that uh, the president sat down with the uh, 10 Republicans the other day to talk about maybe a package that was a little bit smaller. Where do you, where do you see this headed? I think Biden's going to get what he wants. Uh, I think that he's doing the right thing by saying, look, if you can improve this bill, you give me your suggestions and they'll be included to the Republicans. I think that's a good good posture for him. And at the same time, we cannot embrace delay. Now, uh, we're looking at, by next month, 500,000 Americans dead, 25 million infected, 19 million Americans collecting unemployment benefits. Now is not the time to wait. Economists left, right, and center have all said, go big. Uh, the committee that I chair, the Ways and Means Committee, we are in the midst of debating instructions right now on the House floor for the Budget Committee. And we are likely to pass that reconciliation package and budgetary items this afternoon and over the course of the next two days. But it means that the Ways and Means Committee will be responsible for, for spending $950 billion of the $1.9 trillion. So it's half of what's coming up. And I intend to use this opportunity to come to the assistance of those who are really hurting in the American family, people with a lower end who are suffering terribly with what's occurred. People that could work from home, Dave, they've done fine. Stock market's done fine. Those essential workers, they haven't done as well. Getting these schools open is gonna be really important. In addition, making sure that people with a lower end can pay their rent, make their mortgage payments and all, that's the American way. The other thing we look at, too, is, yes, this is a short term fix for it, but the long term fix for this whole thing. I mean, when COVID-19, COVID-19 is never going to go away. We all know that. But the long term effects of this on, on, on the just the American people in general uh, and the economy, uh, that this doesn't go away when COVID goes away. No, in the pandemic, until we defeat it, it's going to dictate economic outcomes. I mean, we've got to defeat the virus this economy to get back up on its feet. The Congressional Budget Office, which is made up of uh, many accomplished individuals, Republican and Democrat, they've indicated that once again, that the economy is in need of uh, an infusion of public support. Jay Powell, who is no raving radical Democrat, I can tell you that, he has essentially said that the economy needs more support, it's faltering. Janet Yellen is a mainstream Democrat. She has pushed for more relief a belief in the idea of what we call liquidity. All that means is cash flow, making sure people in the middle and bottom of the economic scale have the daily sustenance of life. Let's uh, briefly talk about the, the other priorities for Congress uh, in, in this session. Uh, we get beyond COVID-19, what are the priorities? Well, certainly getting to infrastructure is the next big item. And we've danced with that now for years. Uh, speaking of the impasse that currently embroils our political system. Infrastructure used to be the easiest thing to do. Now that's caught up in the polarized Congress. So I think that the conversations I've had with the administration, they're ready to go. I was passed a pretty good infrastructure bill last year. The Ways and Means wrote, Committee wrote half of it. And I'm anticipating that we're gonna do the same this time around. And I said to uh, the president and his advisors that we're ready to go. So I think that uh, Good infrastructure package comes up right away. We're gonna have additional challenges in bolstering Medicare, making sure that uh, Obamacare in and of itself is boosted. You know, in Massachusetts right now, 100% of the children are covered with health insurance. 97% of the adults. 
we bought in this idea that universal coverage could stabilize healthcare rates. And by and large, it's worked. So I think that you're right that the pandemic is not going to go away in its entirety. But once we can get to 70% of the American people being vaccinated, herd immunity will take over. And I think that we'll begin to, once again, be able to embrace social gatherings. Do you see a lot getting done this year, given the fact that uh, Democrats both control the House and the Senate? Yes, I do. I, I also think let's not wish for something that uh, is impossible to occur, because I think that sometimes there are elected officials that build levels of expectation that can't be fulfilled, only contributing more and more to frustration and cynicism. But I do think that, uh, as I've described it, um, the economy and infrastructure and health care, I think there's some pretty good things that we can do. And also treating the issue of racial disparity as it uh, addresses our health care needs is important. I think we can do some pretty good things in terms of climate change and renewable energy and stop hectoring each other over it. I think there are some really solid things that we can do. And I think we're going to pick up some Republican support for this. You survived a, a primary challenge in September. Uh, one of the more contentious challenges I think I've ever seen you have, and I've, I've witnessed all of your elections. Tell me what coming out of that primary, anything new you learned, uh, some s things that you learned about uh, just things in general uh, that you didn't see from any other campaign. Well, I know this, that you're generally driving around in the car with uh, everybody who's got an antenna on their head, and a laptop and sitting on their knees. And they're trying to get you to react to the latest outrage of the moment. It might be 10 seconds old. And again, I think a more measured response was the appropriate one. And, you know, felt pretty good about the fact that uh, when every community easily in Hampton County, the people who know me best. And incidentally, one of the most humorous parts of it for me was uh, we began with a poll that showed I was going to win by 20. We had a poll that we took in the middle that showed it was going to win by 20. And I remember as we polled it for the last six weeks, uh, generally Thursday and Friday, and then on Sunday night, I would talk to the pollster. And going into the last weekend, I said, you're going to poll it again? And uh, David Paleologos from Suffolk University uh, uh, polling in USA Today was pretty good. He said to me, Mr. Chairman, he said, let me tell you something. He said, if you want some help with mental health, he said, I'll poll it again. He said, you don't need to poll it again. He said, you're going to win this race by close to 20 points. And guess what? We won just about 20 points. Wire to wire. You were first elected in 1988. Are you enjoying this as much as you did when you first uh, walked into the House of Congress? I'm enjoying being chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. It's been the uh, apex of achievement for me personally and professionally. You don't get there. It's the uh, most important committee in Congress. You need review from your peers support from your leadership. Most importantly, you need the confidence of the people that vote for you. So in that sense, I'm enjoying it. Do I wish that some of the acrimony uh, would subside, dissipate? Yes, I do. Do I expect that to happen in the near future? No, I don't. And, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, I could be on the cable shows, Dave, every day and night. And I'll do a business show in the afternoon or a tax show once in a while. But the idea that I'm going to be on there night after night with diatribe upon diatribe, castigating anybody and everybody who disagrees with me, uh, number one, I won't do it. And number two, it's not necessary that I do it. We'll know that you're welcome on this podcast anytime. I'm happy to talk to you. In fact, I must tell you, I, uh, I've been doing these with you and there's a couple of others and I'm enjoying them immensely. As am I. So uh, I know you, you've got another meeting to go to, but I, I, I wish you well. Stay healthy. I, you've had your COVID shot. I've had my COVID shot, and uh, I've noticed that you've had a growth uh, on your face that you I've not witnessed before. My uh, my granddaughter hates it, so it may be coming off. Because <laughs> she's her her opinion is the only one that counts. Well, listen, we have grandchildren, and their opinions to me as well are really important. It's it's always good to see you. Good to talk to you, Dave. My thanks to Congressman Richard Neal for taking the time to be part of this week's Even Better Western Mass podcast. I'm Dave Matson. Thanks for watching or listening. Stay safe, stay well, and if you can, join me next week.